Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Sharon and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of Barrow, I would like to welcome you all for the first webinar from Barrow Insights for this quarter and year 2014. So the topic for today is going to be around a model which is expected to bring about a paradigm change in clinical monitoring and that is risk-based monitoring. So before we move ahead with the presentation, I have some general set of instructions as always. During the course of the presentation, if you would like to post a question, you will find a box on the left hand side of the panel which is indicated in red. I request you to type your question and hit the send button and as the presentation progress, I will note down the high frequency questions and will post it to the presenter at the end of the session. If you are experiencing any connection or you are not able to connect to the webinar, please close the window and try going back to the email message and connect through the link that you have received. Just in case you still have further problems, please drop in a quick email to Puneet at puneet.ramol at barrow-inc.com and uh, you will find this email address in the message or the invite that you received from us. Moving on, let me quickly introduce our speakers and panelists for today's webinar. So first, our presenter Ashwin Tripathi and we also have two experts joining us, Dr. Rajesh Jain from India and Mr. Mu from US. Gentlemen, thanks for being part of the discussion and the webinar today. So quickly to introduce our panelists and our presenter today to start off with Ashwini Tupati. Ashwini is a senior research analyst, clinical research at Bello. With his rich industry experience in the past and deep category knowledge, he has successfully delivered procurement solution and has also advised clients on regulatory affairs, pharmacovigilance, clinical staffing, patient recruitment and medical monitoring. Our experts, Dr. Rajesh Jain, an independent expert, is a senior clinical research professional with 20 years of experience in global clinical research environment. He brings strong leadership skills developed through all stages of clinical studies and proven ability to successfully achieve results within multiple cultural and geographical diverse teams. He has substantial clinical operation expertise in numerous therapeutic areas. His skills include in-depth knowledge of clinical drug development process, GCP, ICH regulations and global business principle. Welcome Dr. Rajesh Jain. Then another expert for today's webinar is Mr. Mu, uh, who has joined us from the from US, President and Chief Scientific Officer of Annex Clinical. Mu has nearly 10 years of extensive experience in business analytics, clinical trials and healthcare business operations. Mu's experience stems from hospital setting clinical research and phase 1 to phase 4 in various therapeutic areas. Mu has been invited to present case studies at several clinical trial conferences and he is an editorial advisory board member at AppliedClinicalTrialsOnline.com. He has been mentioned in Financial Times as an industry expert and is a member of ACRP. Thanks once again for joining us today. <clears throat> Without further ado, let me pass it on to Ashwini, our presenter, and he will introduce the topic and take it forward from here. Thank you, Sharon. And hello, everyone. Over the past couple of years, there has been a lot of discussions, speculations and buzz around a new model in the industry. The US FDA had released a guideline in August 2013 and consecutively EMA, European Medicine Agency, has also recently finalized a reflection paper on risk-based monitoring, which promises an opportunity for the industry to change the paradigm of clinical monitoring. So what you see on this slide are the snapshots of the regulatory documents released by US FDA and the reflection paper 
finalized by EMA on risk-based monitoring. However, we are not going to be discussing these documents, but rather will focus to understand the need and the benefits of risk-based monitoring in an easier way. So let's take an example. The green dots which you see on this global map represent ongoing clinical trials. And traditionally, the sponsors believed that these regulatory agencies expect frequent mo monitoring visits coupled with 100% source data verification of all the trials irrespective of the study design or the complexity. But even with this level of intense monitoring, neither the integrity of the data nor the investigator performance has improved. Rather, it has been deteriorated in some of the single trial sites which have been represented in red color. Actually, these sites have erroneous or fraudulent data reported. So, what does this indicate? As per the risk-based monitoring guidelines, the clinical monitoring needs to target data or the data points like dubious patient enrollment or inconsistent adverse event reported across the globe, which may impact the quality and the integrity of the clinical trial and the data as well. But moving on, as you can see, there are a couple of triangles in green color which have been represented, have been maintained with altogether a different approach, or you could say by applying risk-based monitoring. And they haven't been performing 100% source data verification managed by statistical tool or IT systems. So the other key takeaway which comes into play is that you can customize your strategy. You can customize your monitoring as per the need of the clinical trial. So as per the risk-based monitoring guidelines, you should target the most important and crucial data. And at the same time, you need not to do 100% source data verification for all the trials on all the sites for all the patients. And at the same time, in the past couple of years, the drug industry, the CROs, clinical research organizations, business solution company, and the regulatory agencies have joined their hands together to come up with a level of solution. So for today's webinar, we will focus on how the need has arised for such monitoring guidelines then how we can utilize this opportunity to optimize time and money. And as all of us know that once you are going to have a new model in place, certainly you are going to face certain challenges and it requires some level of prerequisites. And we are going to look into certain areas to be looked first. And then we have our experts to share their conclusive insights on this webinar. So let's visualize the whole value chain of the drug industry. And as per the statistics, it takes almost 10 to 15 years to bring a drug out of 5,000 to 10,000 compounds from pre-discovery stage to the market. And in context of financials, the drug industry has invested, and this invested investment has increased by 233% in last 12 to 13 years, and which is due to the money invested in process improvement, followed by the transition in the focus from pharmaceuticals to biological products, and then changing regulatory landscape over the years, and last but not the least, the drug failures across various phases of the clinical trials, due to which the pharma industry, the drug industry, again started pumping in a lot of amount in the R&D research and development. So what goes into research and development as such, which is $130 billion spent annually, and as you can make out, almost 45% of the spent as such is only going to clinical trials. So let's break down what is this investment all about. And we can see that 
close to 44% is only spent on clinical monitoring. And then we look into later stage of clinical monitoring to say phase 3 or phase 4, even it can take up half of the cost of the clinical development project and which is only because of the traditional methodology applied for the clinical monitoring. So what are the challenges in the current setup of clinical monitoring? For us to understand how risk-based monitoring could help, we need to understand the challenges and where are the possible opportunities. And in the current setup and current environment, to start with, too many resources have been deployed to several clinical trial sites and it has become resource intensive, followed by systemic errors. Even after having these many resources performing 100% source data verification, which means sending a CRA to a particular site to look into every single data of a patient. And the clinical trial, which demands high precision and high accuracy, has been incurring systemic errors, which is, which is not good for clinical trials. And then equal monitoring for every site irrespective of the study design or the complexity of the trial, as every single site differs in therapeutic area of the patient population. And then the reactive behavior which has been practiced, which leads to unplanned visits to a site, and which further leads to the cost to the clinical monitoring and cost to the company. And last but not the least, the monitoring of clinical investigation guideline from 1988 has been withdrawn. So we need to change the approach. And to start with, the release of guidelines, which I have discussed in the early part of the webinar by the US FDA, followed by the finalized reflection paper in the month of November last year, and the draft guideline from UK MHRA. And one thing is very common among all these guidelines is they encourage the adoption of risk-based monitoring and suggest the industry to focus on the most crucial and the critical aspect of the clinical trial. And as for the various studies, we have found that after applying risk-based model, the industry can save 15 to 20 percent of the cost incurred during the clinical monitoring and which is only because of reduction of the source data verification. And to support, as one of the leading CROs has performed a comparative study between traditional and risk-based monitoring, but not to be surprised, the results indicated that the CRO was able to reduce the site visits by 25 percent and at the same time the resource utilization, the CRA resource utilization increased from 10 to 75 percent, which is a good news for the industry. And then resource management, which is the most critical aspect. And after looking into risk-based model, a company would be able to deploy the optimal number of resources on the particular site, and which may save more than 35% of monitoring hours per patient, which we are going to discuss in the later part of our webinar. Followed by the reduced time to market. Almost 40% of the drugs fail in phase 2 and phase 3 only due to the safety and efficacy of related to subjects in the trial. But the proactive approach which will be applied can save three to four years of the time to bring a drug to the market. So, Mr. Mo, we would like to have your opinion on the optimization of the monitoring cost incurred during the clinical monitoring. Uh, certainly, and thank you for this opportunity, Ashwini. So, why does monitoring cost so much in clinical trials? I mean, we're talking about the, as Ashwini was mentioning before, the clinical operations, the clinical trials actually takes approximately 44% of a biopharmaceutical investments, and then monitoring c can cost uh, around 40 to 50% of a clinical trial. So why does monitoring cost so much? Well, there are several reasons according to the literature. 
and based on my experience, it is primarily because of suboptimal protocol design. Um, as some of us may or may not know, it, the indirect and direct costs of amending a protocol cost $500,000. And in addition to that, the amount of data that we are collecting is increasing substantially. For instance, the mean endpoints per protocol increased by 100%, and the total number of procedures increased by 57% from 2000 to 2015, respectively. So having that said, we're collecting way too much data that is not necessary for critical endpoints, which is IND approval. Um, we're talking about achieving FDA's requirements as well as post-marketing requirements for competitive advantages. Another area includes a lot of confusion in the type of data that we collect, as there is currently a big gap between post-marketing and R&D communications. So the post-marketing team requests uh, certain data to be uh, collected because right now with healthcare reform, a lot of uh, the healthcare environment is changing in order to uh, obtain approval from payers and as well successfully market the products. So how do you collect sufficient data during the clinical trial in order to address post-marketing needs? There's a lot of confusion in that area which is also resulting in suboptimal protocol design. So here we are with highly complicated protocols with a minimal amount of effectiveness which is resulting in increased monitoring resources. So having that said, centralized monitoring can actually be enhanced through protocol optimization, meaning focusing on critical data, again, that is necessary for IND approval and post-marketing needs. And I believe, uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mo, for uh, the critical insight. And I believe after applying risk-based modeling and having statistical data well in place, you'll be able to reduce the number of protocol amendments during the clinical trial. So now, how we can utilize this opportunity of having risk-based monitoring in place to save time and money? And time and money will only be optimized by optimizing the resource utilization, the resource which is the backbone of clinical trials. So who are these resources? And they are the CRAs, Clinical Research Associates. They are the building blocks of the clinical monitoring and who plays a very critical and essential role in clinical trials to ensure the quality and the integrity of the data, but at the same time, they maintain a rapport between the sponsors and their partner CROs and the investigational site. So let's see how much effort these CROs have been putting in a clinical trial study. And as per one of the studies conducted by Tuff CSDD, the CRA's workload includes 41% of on-site monitoring and then the other critical spend is almost 19% which have been spent only on traveling. So the time and efforts put in by a CRA during on-site monitoring can be reduced using risk-based monitoring by having a centralized monitor. And this centralized monitor will have access to all the data from all the sites and which can communicate this to a CRA to trigger a site visit. So Dr. Jan, after decreased on-site monitoring and travel time, how the responsibilities of CRAs will change and evolve in future, wherein they are going to work independently and having these skills in-house, or they have to communicate with a set of analysts to perform such visits effectively. Dr. Jan. Ashwini, thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, with the advent of uh, remote uh, and risk or adaptive monitoring, the role of CRA is undergoing a major transformational change. We all can see that. Now, uh, we are now incorporating clinical IT systems. We are operating, uh, adopting new clinical oper operating models through the risk-based monitoring initiative. So what happens is that the CRA now has to play three big tasks. He has to visualize data and visualize this data from end-to-end -end processes such as operational performance metrics, safety data, uh, the IRX, IXRS data or project management. He has to use analytical 
framework like trend analysis, comparative analysis to direct his activities. And you know, using the statistical principles, he has to associate with team members who would help him uh, do the interpretation of these data and the analytics that are being gathered. So uh, what this means now that the CRA is basically a two-faced person, uh, could be in two bodies uh, for cost efficiency as you mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the bodies which is a remote monitor, he is going to be based in some low cost uh, location and then you have the field monitor who is basically going to the investigator sites for doing certain set of monitoring activities at the investigator site itself. Um, so, so what, what it means is that now I have my CRAs uh, who are the field monitors have now got to perform like a site manager. They are more of a site manager where they have to focus on the quality processes that will improve the functioning at the site. They may have to add things like how is the site organized, who does what, uh, about how, by whom and where source is created what requirements, procedures, guidelines exist at site and so on and so forth. And once he focuses his attention on these sort of managerial uh, relationship building questions, he is going to improve the quality of the sites. Uh, on the other hand, the person who is the remote monitor who is basically sitting in some distant location, his job is going to be playing that of a business analytic and analyzing the data and coming communicating with the field monitor and other stakeholders including the investigator sites to drive the performance of the, uh, of the sites, of the data and the quality of the trial. Thank you Dr. Jain and I believe... So I'd like to add something here. Yes Mr. Mo, please. That's okay. So I also want to, in, in, in addition to Dr. Jain's uh, response which is excellent, I want to emphasize the importance that trans, uh, of source document verification versus source data review. And those are points that are actually indicated in Transcelerate's uh, guidance documents on risk-based monitoring. The current practices, of course, for source document verification, um, what Transcelerate did is they, they took a look at previous trials and they did a study to evaluate the effectiveness of source document verification and they have found that activity to actually be quite ineffective. Um, and here, for example, the queries generated from SDV divided by the total number of queries with 7.8%. But when we're talking about critical data queries, meaning critical data points affecting study primary, secondary endpoints and what have you, the critical data queries generated by source document verification over the total queries were 2.36%, meaning that source document verification, in fact, has a minimal impact on uh, data quality. So what Transcelerate is suggesting is source data review, meaning comparing the source quality compliance critical processes and critical source documentation to the original source, which enables risk prioritization, a focus on compliance issue, and as well data critical to the study endpoint analysis. And let's say, for example, we t a centralized monitor identifies that a site has underreported an adverse event from a statistical perspective. Instead of what we currently do, which is send out a monitor to go to the site to really do trans translational error verification, we are actually taking a look at what are the factors that prevented the site from reporting this adverse event. In essence, source data review is much more effective. So the risk-based monitoring model essentially would involve a centralized monitor accessing data through IT systems. Then the centralized monitor needs to be able to interpret that data and analyze it from a risk perspective by conducting analytical assessments to identify unusual trends. And then Findings are documented in a kappa. This kappa is correspondingly provided to an on-site monitor who then does source data review to investigate those discrepancies. And then, of course, the corrective actions are documented in a kappa. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mo. Uh, and I believe that there will be a transformation in the role of clinical research associate. Yeah, please, please, Dr. Jan.
Sorry, sorry, Ashwini. And just an addi very important additional point in addition mm -hmm. to what Mr. Kamo just said, a very, very valid uh, point on the SDR. Uh, what this also means that from the standards of or the, the you know from the routine hundred percent SDV done at site, clinical monitoring models are going to undergo a massive change. Now the very fact that you interpret the source data verification and the source data review concept, what it translates also is that there is enough of CRF data that one can actually do a remote review, verify the data and kind of lock off on that or sign off on that as a monitor which will further enhance the cost gains that you want to achieve through the remote monitoring principles. And I completely agree with you, Dr. Jan and Mr. Mo, and uh, this role is certainly going to transform in terms of acquiring management skills and analytical skills, keeping HAPA corrective action and preventive action plan in place, and certainly this source data verification will turn into source data review. And keeping all these things in mind, the CRS will be enabled with analytical skills to identify a problematic missing data before visiting a site, which will make the trials more successful. And to support resource utilization effectiveness, the CRAs, we analyzed a couple of studies conducted by some mid-size CROs like ClinPace and large CROs like Quintiles and Icon. Now if you observe this run chart, which has been plotted between number of patients enrolled in number of sites, against the monitoring hours spent by CRAs per patient. So you can see it's a normal phenomena that the patient enrollment has been less on a couple of sites, which is not an unusual phenomena in trials. But what is unusual is that CRAs have been spending a lot of hours on low enrolling sites, rather spending on high enrolling sites. But what is interesting to observe and see is that once we are going to implement risk-based monitoring in place, it has reduced significantly and the reduction could be more than 35% of monitoring hours spent per patient. And this difference was only due to better utilization of resources, use of technology, analyzing risk while in time and the proactive approach towards the trial. So this is going to change the certain and the current landscape of clinical trials as such. But the implementation of a new model has its own challenges. And then we have to look into the prerequisites and fundamental requirements. And certainly it will have a couple of ripple, ripple effects. And the closest will be the clinical operations, wherein the clinical monitors are directly involved. These monitors should be made available with the data well in time. And at the same time, the site personnel, like site coordinator and principal investigator, should be ready for the surprise visit. And they should coordinate such type of visits, which will make risk-based model perform efficiently. Then followed by the clinical IT, which has been playing a critical role in clinical trial over the years. But to take one simple example, EDC approximately took 10 years to reach to 70% of the adoption rate. And the scenario is even worse in emerging nation where they're still using paper system. So the clinical IT and the IT players have to come up with a promising request and the models in place to support risk-based monitoring in the world of cloud computing. Then followed by clinical staffing. The staff and the resources are the backbone of clinical monitoring. And in this industry, in the drug industry, 92% of the companies have been outsourcing clinical staffing to support their monitoring functions. So as per this new model, the new requirement of risk-based monitoring, these partners should be able to support with such kind of resources which can function 
into this new model. And at the same time, due to the lack of proven methodology, like most of the projects are in pilot stage, and no one project can give a streamlined thought that this should be followed for this monitoring, can impact the engagement model between the sponsors and the partners. In the current scenario, it has been a full service provider's engagement model, which is strategic. But for the risk-based monitoring, we can see certain examples wherein a sponsor is moving out of FSP and going with a niche player who is specialized in a certain therapeutic area or geography can play a good role under project management engagement model. So Mr. Mo, what are your views on implementation of efficient business infrastructures to execute risk-based modeling? That's an excellent question, Ashwini. And, you know, the paradigm of risk-based monitoring continues to change every day uh, as we start to discover what is really required in order to execute um, such infrastructures, to implement such infrastructures efficiently. Um, well, in this case, sponsors as well as CROs must develop key performance and key risk indicators or KPI and KRI models in order to establish quantitative means for CAPA triggers and performance measurement, while Transcelerate identifies the various risk assessment models and its position on risk-based monitoring, um, this paper has not been very well received, particularly by European auditors, because it advises biopharmaceutical companies to implement qualitative means and subjective means rather than quantitative means. So establishing KPI and KRIs really assists with quantifying that risk. So this risk must also be evaluated on a broader level. So we're talking about risk categories could include the sponsored experience, scientific novelty, disease and population characteristics, trial methodology, and development stages. And then the, it needs to be drilled down to the clinical trial level. So we're talking, for example, the number of subjects enrolled and the recruitment per site, the number of protocol deviations and adverse events. Um, and what are those triggers that will trigger an on-site monitoring visit when a centralized monitoring assessment is conducted? Uh, when we're talking about taking a look at KPI and KRIs on the clinical trial level, it is important to be able to analyze that data empirically. So for example, what triggered an FDA audit in a CNS trial or in an oncology clinical trial? What has resulted in an IND disapproval? If it is certain data, we need to focus on those data points and then put them in the KPI and KRI model. Then when you implement this from, an, from a business standpoint, you need to be able to put weights on each of those KPI and KRI parameters so that when, a certain, when you receive a certain violation or a deviation, you won't unnecessarily trigger a monitoring visit. Uh, you need to be able to conduct this in an efficient manner and weighing those KPI and KRI models really optimizes the business aspect of centralized and risk-based monitoring. And when it comes to implementing uh, IT systems, I want to emphasize that you have to be able to understand the business process behind what you want to accomplish. So if we're talking about initiating a trigger automatically through EDC integration, for instance, and integration from a variety of different data points, you need to be able to have that IT system offer the trigger for the centralized monitor to write a CAPA. And I'll let Dr. Jane uh, further address the IT aspect of efficient business processes. So Dr. Jane, do you have any, uh, anything you'd like to add in that arena? Thank you, Dr. Uh, important point, right? So when all the IT systems are talked, it's just an interface. Uh, you would not be able to completely utilize the system unless you modify your process. Uh, if you look at all the developments that are happening for the risk-based monitoring solutions, which is, a com which is actually an uh, uh, addition of two things. One is the IT, uh, IT system that you mentioned, and second is modifying your processes in such a manner that you utilize the system to do a lot of your operational activities 
uh, with the mobility solutions in place today, people are developing iPad compatible monitoring visit reports, which you you know just uh, select the appropriate responses, type in short comments, integrates itself with a CDMS solution, and therefore your monitoring visit report is done practically while you're doing a monitoring visit. Now, secondly, as we mentioned earlier, that the remote monitor new role that has been introduced is going to visualize all the ARIs, KPIs, quality metrics, the statistical trend analysis, and he's going to work with the monitor in triggering a site, shell, a site visit. So all of these are going to require a huge modifications to your clin existing clinical operations. Uh, the way uh, information flow is managed between different stakeholders, such as the clinical operations team, the clinical data management team, the statistical team, the medical monitoring team, and so on and so forth. So typically, as of today, all of these work in their own silos, in their own compartments. But because of risk-based monitoring, uh, adaptive monitoring, targeted monitoring, whichever terminology you use, all of these now need to come up as a core team which is going to drive the clinical operations efficiency and the productivity gains that you would want to achieve. Mr. Mo, would you like to add something to this? Sure. I, I, Dr. Jane made some excellent points regarding the business aspects, especially when it comes to optimizing IT systems. Um, again, when we're talking about establishing KPI and KRI models, you need to be able to ensure that you're not unnecessarily triggering an on-site monitoring visit. So optimizing those models through clinical IT systems can really enhance and control uh, unnecessary monitoring visits, which would further enhance and reduce the costs of central, centralized and risk-based monitoring. Great, Mr. Mo, and I believe that IT system is certainly going to enable risk-based modeling to function effectively. Then we try to look into a couple of areas which could be primary focus areas for the industry. And of course, the first would be the geography, where the most of the trials have been happening, and it's North America, especially USA, which covers 44% of the trials. And at the same time, the CRA workload is also higher in this region in compared to rest of the world, followed by the phase in which phase it should be applied. And yes, of course, that source data verification consumes almost 34% of phase 3 budget. So it should be looked into phase 3 and plus also into phase 4 and the late phases of the study. At the same time, we try to look into which therapeutic areas to be looked for and of course it is oncology followed by central nervous system. Then the drug industry should closely look into trials and try to optimize the areas posing the most of the risk and as per the study conducted by ACRP, Association of Clinical Research Professionals, we found in a clinical study where the risks originate are insufficient planning, the population or the volunteers enrolled or how the protocol has been designed. An outcome of the research was that the planning and right selection of investigators, principal investigators and clinical trial site is very important. And then who has the greatest opportunity to mitigate this risk to the subject who makes the trial successful and of course the investigator and then followed by the sponsor. So the outcome of the research again was that the training of these investigators and the continuous communication between sponsor and investigator will play a very critical role in terms of making any trial successful. And then we try to look into the metrics which can best describe the approach to measure the monitoring effectiveness. And then we found that the type of visit, is it reactive, proactive, based upon the historical data of that particular site, 
triggered by a centralized monitor, these are going to play a very crucial role, keeping in the mind the compliance status of that particular site. And one very important key aspect, which is enrollment status, the patient enrollment status, which gives a very clear idea about any site, how it has been performing. And as per this study, the outcome was that proactive approach and type of visit will make the trial successful. So Dr. Jan, what are your suggestions on these crucial aspects? Oh, actually, a very important point that you made on an earlier slide is how do you minimize this or how do you maximize the benefit of the trial that you're doing, whether it is a uh, subject level. Dr. Jan, sorry to interrupt, but we are unable to hear you. Could you be oh, loud? I'm so sorry. I hope this is a little better. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. What I was mentioning is that you did make a point of uh, uh, risk uh, and, and, and risk management in your earlier slide. And you know what risk-based monitoring classically says is just don't look at a data point. Look at it from a historical perspective. Look at it from a, 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 a larger scenario perspective. Uh, let's look at the uh, planning phase, you know, that basically risk-based monitoring starts over there. Uh, whether it is a site selection, you have enough of historical data that can predict how a trial would perform in a particular geography. Uh, these are elements where basically from where risk planning of a trial starts and the risk stratification of a trial starts and risk-based monitoring pretty much advocates that philosophy saying make your study planning more efficient by being able to identify one the right sites where to go to the right critical data that will influence the study outcome and thereby the uh, regulatory impact that you want to achieve rather than gathering so much of unwarranted data uh, I'm sure Mr. Mo will be able to give you some statistics on what amount of data the FDA looks at when it is looking to approve a trial or a product. I mean, uh, there is enough of data to present that to tell us that we collect enough of non-required information as well, which bring which tends to bring in a lot more inefficiency. Secondly, uh, when you talk about uh, you know. Uh, the effectiveness of implementation of a new model, you have got to focus a lot on the training as well. And this training is across the board, across all the stakeholders that are concerned. Let it be the investigators. We, we made a point that EDC adoption is still not at the best. It's very good in certain parts of the world and not so good at the other parts of the world. We may have to uh, go through a similar uh, sort of a scenario uh, with the investigator side, when we talk about adoption of a new clinical ID system, uh, they are an important stakeholders to this. Without their efficient use of the new risk-based ID system that we use, uh, this, this model may just about fail. Uh, what the Transcelerate is also trying to do as one of their initiatives is build one such portal which can act as a repository of information to allow people to analyze what has gone well and what has not gone well across a particular type of a protocol design or an investigator side performance. You need to take all of this into an holistic view, uh, translate that into a, a training requirement, a new training environment and enforce people to do that. Uh, Phase-wise implementation is a good idea that you mentioned uh, a little while back saying that it's better to start with a developed geography, a more advanced geography, and then move into some of the emerging economies where the adoption rate might be a little slower, but with period in time, they will be able to catch up faster. Mr. Moore, would you like to add on something? Dr. Jin, and, and you've made some excellent points, especially with regards to IT integration. And I believe that, um, from what I understand, about 70% of clinical trials have adopted electronic systems in their CRF collection methodologies. So 
most most of big, big biopharmaceutical companies are, are leveraging uh, such technologies. However, there's still a, a big gap in IT adoption. I want to go back to some of the slides that Ashwini was uh, pointing out regarding subject enrollment and site selection issues. I mean, we're talking, according to the literature, 80% of clinical trials fail to meet their original accrual goals, and that's because of trial unpredictability and inability to speak to the patient's needs, um, suboptimal inclusion exclusion criteria design, and what have you. So having that said, sponsors through enhanced strategies can actually reduce timeline slippage during the clinical trial. And let me further elaborate. When we're talking about strategies, I'm going to reference protocol optimization. And while I did mention protocol optimization earlier, there are many different aspects. One of these aspects, as it relates to subject enrollment, involves optimizing the inclusion and exclusion criteria to analytical data about existing patient populations. So you can actually test the protocol on existing patient populations to see whether there is any enrollment viability and how do you optimize that protocol and leverage these techniques in order to address FDA requirements and post-marketing requirements. That's where you can significantly enhance enrollment rates or catalyze enrollment rates without having to spend significant capital during the trial. Another area that can actually really assist with, um, with uh, enhancing enrollment or what I call catalyzing enrollment is what we call site selection optimization, meaning not only selecting sites in geodemographic areas that are more likely to enroll, but particularly selecting sites that are pre-qualified and actually have really good uh, history and records. And what's even great is that we can now leverage and adopt algorithmic processes in order to predict enrollment rates, not only for the clinical trial, but even on the study site level. So you can actually assess enrollment viability for a study site by putting them in, an, in a, through an algorithm based on their geodemographic location, patient population access, and what have you. So in that essence, during the trial conduct, you would feel confident that those sites are likely to enroll and offer high quality clinical trial data. Uh, what's important, that another important point I want to emphasize is during the site selection uh, strategies, you have to be able to select sites that have some sort of certification and qualification in order to obtain consistent data because sometimes clinical trial data can be subjective. So again, select sites that are certified in clinical trials and GCP, as well as optimize your strategies through analytics. That will help catalyze enrollment. And certainly I agree with you, Mr. Mo. And keeping these things in mind, we looked into a couple of initiatives from the industry. And to start with, Translate, and it was very well discussed during our webinar today. So we'll move to the next one. And in terms of academic institutes, they have been also playing a very crucial role and there are a couple of studies and one such study is Adamon based upon the name adaptive monitoring which simply means adaptive monitoring you are going to adapt your monitoring clinical monitoring according to the need of the site and one very important thing about this that it has been designed to answer the most precise question on how effective risk this monitoring could be and the primary objective is to investigate whether the reduced monitoring is equivalent to extensive full monitoring approach or not. And as per this study, they have come up with case classification, which is like K1, which is the high prioritized site wherein you can send your monitor for six visits in a year, followed by K2 and the K3, which will reduce till one monitoring in a year. So you can see there is 70 to 80 percent of the reduction in the site visits as such. And this study will come up with the results by the end of this year in the month of December. Then followed by the Optimon, which is not very too much discussed in the secondary or the uh, when we look into the research, it is based upon the name optimization of monitoring and it has been started in France and the basic idea behind this study is the evaluation of monitoring strategy and this study was 
started with 100% source data verification, keeping in mind the traditional monitoring methodologies, and then slowly take it forward to light monitoring, means reducing your site visits, reducing 100% source data verification, and it is coming up with nice results. So apart from these, there are a lot of initiatives taken by pharmaceutical companies and CROs conducting research monitoring. So in the near future, we will be able to see the clinical monitoring shifting more towards web-based system, where instead of one monitor visiting a site and looking into all the data, he or she will be verifying data across the site. And we will be able to see clinical trial management system and clinical data management will work as more integrated and streamlined system wherein IT companies have to play a very crucial role. So Mr. Mo and Dr. Jan, this is a question to both of you from my side is that what are the KPIs a sponsor should look into in selecting the best partner for risk-based monitoring? Sure. So um, I, I want to better understand that, that I heard the question. Your voice is a little muffled, Dr. So are you mentioning that what are the best KPI models to implement for risk-based monitoring? Uh, the KPIs in a partner, a supplier, whom the sponsor should choose to go for, for risk-based sure. modeling. Sure. Well, if you're going to go with a supplier, you have to make sure that Firstly, the supplier has the therapeutic expertise and the experience that is necessary in order to, uh, conduct, in order to evaluate those KPI and KRI models. Um, you know, typically, oh, in, in evaluating quantitative means, it is also important that the supplier must have access to a variety of different databases to be able to analyze those KPI and KRI models against um, against what the clinical trial is needing. Um, not to mention, again, therapeutic expertise is very important here. Um, another important facet is the ability to understand how are you going to optimize your business operations to achieve your business goals. I mean, the reason why the FDA released its guidance on risk-based monitoring is because we all realize that many of our trials are still run like scientific experiments um, back in the 80s and 90s. But in today's economy, many investors, as well as biopharmaceutical companies, are scrutinizing the R&D process because it just costs so much and it is unsustainable. So the FDA is listening to that and they're saying it's okay for sponsors to conduct risk-based monitoring as long as it's within, as long as we are offered high quality data, as well as that there's good data integrity. But you have to be able to reduce costs and enhance quality. And those all require a level of expertise, not only therapeutic and scientific expertise, but also business and financial expertise in successful RBM strategies. Thank you, Mr. Mo, for your, for your insight on selecting the best partner to go with. And now I will hand over to our moderator, Sharan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashwini, and uh, that wraps up our presentation. And uh, uh, we just have a question from one of our attendees, uh, to, uh, which I would like to address to uh, Mu and Dr. Jane. So there was a question around, uh, are emerging, emerging nations ready for risk-based monitoring? So uh, it would be good if you could just throw some uh, light into, uh, and also if you could share your thoughts if emerging markets are ready to take up risk-based monitoring. Sure. I guess I'll start with this, and I'll allow Dr. Jane to add on to what I'm saying. Sure. <clears throat> so emerging nations is quite a fascinating topic, particularly here in the U.S., uh, because when we're, taking, when we're taking a look at the increase in clinical trials um, from a percent change perspective, um, you know, from 1992, clinical trial growth in Asia through about 2011 increased by 400,000 percent. And this is Asia in general. 
when we're talking about India, nonetheless, um, there has been a huge surge in clinical trials in 2011 uh, for, new, uh, for new clinical trials. And what's interesting is in 2012 and 13, the number of new clinical trials initiated in India dropped by over 50 percent. And why is, that, why, why is that the case? Well, there were primarily concerns from the DCGI because they were halting clinical trials, so that was scaring sponsors away. And secondly, um, there were concerns around the quality of the data and the integrity of the data coming out of these nations. Um, you know, there are, there have, study sites in those nations have not been fully certified, and therefore some physicians may inadvertently be uh, con conducting fraud without them really understanding or knowing what it is. So what does risk-based monitoring do for sponsors, westernized sponsors, to enter into emerging nations and obtain the data that is necessary? Well, according to the um, Office of Inspector General, over 80% of clinical trials submitted to the U.S. FDA contains data from ex-U.S. or emerging nations. So that means that the FDA is saying it's okay to include such data. Nonetheless, they expressed concerns regarding locating that data when they actually went to the study site. So what does centralized monitoring enable us to do? Firstly, centralized monitoring and risk-based monitoring enables us to have real-time access to data, of course, with advanced IT system implementation in those countries so that we have real-time data. And what's great about centralized monitoring is that it enables U.S. sponsors or westernized sponsors to monitor the data efficiently and then send monitors out to those sites that is for critical data queries or CAPAs that are necessary. So again, this enables, risk-based monitoring enables us to be, to be able to enter those nations without really having to worry about fraud, without having to worry about low data quality. And in the future, we strongly believe that with the appointment of Dr. Altaf Lal, uh, who is a former head of the FDA, in the Indian DCGI, that the regulatory environment will stabilize. And eventually, we will be able to conduct clinical trials in emerging nations. And again, from, from, a, from an enrollment perspective, uh, you know, there, there are limitless opportunities in accessing patients. Um, again, it's a matter of ethics and control. And again, risk-based monitoring enables us to do that. So what are your thoughts, Dr. Jane, on the IT implementation and the necessity to be able to implement IT systems in emerging nations? Thank you, Mr. Moore. You, you, you bring out very important points. You know, and the last two words, uh, I, I, I perhaps the golden words on this is the ethics and the control. Uh, emerging countries, and uh, I would speak on emerging in a larger context, uh, India in a very specific context, the problems that we have uh, on the ethics side is the illiteracy rate at the patient level, which has raised certain questions around the informed consenting process. Uh, as, as perhaps somebody would know that recently the DCGI from the Indian Health Authorities mandated a video consenting process. Now, IT has a solution uh, or probably can develop a solution to address many of these concerns. Uh, the ethical practices, the direct access to records, uh, direct, uh, real, more real-time visibility to the data, and therefore the ability for any sponsor sitting in any part of the world, be it the U.S. or anywhere else, to be able to pick up misconduct, frauds, data outliers pretty much quickly. What had happened erstwhile was patient enrollment capabilities was the drive. And what got missed out was the controls that were required to be put in place by uh, clinical research organizations, uh, both the CRO and the sponsors alike, was putting these controls on what types of sites are getting selected, how are the source documents, and IT as, in, as, as, a, as a sector, as an industry sector, we all know that India leads IT sectors. I mean, any clinical IT systems, uh, many of your uh, CDMS, CTMS, all these systems are 
today uh, supported or have a backbone which comes from India. So adoption of ID systems may not be a challenge. What would re be required would be to put the controls in place. What would be required is to spend a lot of time uh, investing on training the investigator sites and the monitors alike on the adoption of these IT systems for the ultimate benefit of the quality uh, and, and the right uh, ethically correct data so that emerging markets can continue to participate in global clinical trials. Excellent points, Dr. Jane. And I want to add to that. Um, you, you were indicating that the real problem here is suboptimal um, standards, quality standards in clinical operations. And I agree 100% with that because based on what we've seen, uh, a lot of the CROs in India particularly in, or even in emerging nations, do not have what we call in the U.S. gold standard business operating procedures. And what we're starting to see is some CROs, very few of them actually, in India, are starting to develop and investing in gold standard infrastructures and quality management systems. And in combination with IT systems, uh, that really can enhance the ability for uh, U.S. and ex and uh, European sponsors to trust that the CRO partner in emerging nations is actually equivalent in quality and their operating procedures as Western cultures. In addition, that also sets an example for the healthcare regulatory authority that, hey, this CRO actually knows what they're doing and um, it also minimizes the impact for the DCGI2 interfere with the clinical trial. Um, another aspect that I want to emphasize is there's this nonprofit organization called the Alliance for Clinical Research Excellence and Safety, ACRES, and what they're doing is they're implementing global training standards for clinical trial study sites. So if you are going to be selecting study sites in India, you have to make sure that they're certified and trained in clinical research. Now, again, experience is going to be an important Yeah, Mr. Aspect. Moore, I couldn't agree more than uh, more with you. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Mo, I couldn't agree more with you. And I, yeah. uh, I said I couldn't agree more with you on the implementation of gold standards. Uh, as I did say you know, a little while back that you know, what attracted and why only India? I mean, extend the thoughts to uh, uh, China, extend the thoughts to uh, Taiwan. Uh, where the basic attraction to all of these geographies where it starts from is the speed of enrollment. Uh, and it pretty pretty much tries to cover up for the delays in enrollment that you see in more of the developed geographies. And the more controls with the use of the clinical ID systems that are put in place will obviously enhance the quality of the data, will enhance the safety perception that people will develop, including the regulatory agencies. I having monit having run CROs in India myself, including an India unit of a global CRO. Uh, you know, I, I would get clients who would say, hey, you know what, I need to do 70% patients from India. And I'm like, is this an India intended trial? Are you looking at uh, 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 the drug to be made for India or a drug that you want to go to market in India? And when you start asking such questions, then you realize that, oh, they want to only cover up for the enrollment coming to India, which again does not put the a regulatory framework in a good spot because at the end of the day the regulators are also interested in the healthcare benefits that the patients in the country should drive. So I would, I, I would, while we need to put the controls on the healthcare standards and the practicing investigators, you know, I think we should also equally put controls on the clinical research sponsoring industry. I think emerging economy is not just for enrollment speed, uh, it is pretty much also for ensuring a more, uh, uh, a more wider span of uh, uh, data from uh, different uh, geographies and different uh, um, uh, race of people, you know, the different cultures, so that you will get a more holistic view of the performance of your drug. Right, gentlemen. I think uh, that's that's uh, a lot of valuable inputs that uh, has been shared. 
And uh, uh, in the interest of time, I think that brings us to a close of today's webinar. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Jane and Mr. Mu for all your valuable inputs. And uh, we would like to sign off now. And thank you. Have a great day ahead. Bye for now.